Ruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to our home. This week I'd like to begin my thoughts. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, examine the character trait of impatience um, as it relates both to Judaism and to life in general. Again, it's a little bit of a connection to the Jews in the desert. Again, as we had talked about last couple of weeks of us, to what their sin actually was. Now, though impatience is really not a sin by itself, it does create the possibility of transgressing many commandments that are associated with it, such as anger or hatred, Lashon Hara, again, tail-bearing, amongst others. It has the ability to destroy relationships between spouses, friends, and family. It can damage a person's business and his relationship with their clients. It can even destroy one's relationship with God Almighty, their Father in Heaven. In this, my thought, I will be referring to both impatience and patience, since I see them both as either side of the same coin. You know, if we look into the Torah, we find that this trait was introduced into the world with the creation of Adam, first man. It was a contributing factor that led him and Chava, his wife, to go against God's command not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, there are different opinions as to exactly which fruit the tree of knowledge was, but most of the commentaries agree that the fruit of the tree was a grape. According to Kabbalah, Adam was created on the ninth hour of the sixth day of creation. He was told by God Almighty that he could eat from any of the trees in the garden, any except for the tree of knowledge and from the tree of life that were in the center of the garden. Adam was instructed that, all, that he only had to wait for three hours, and when the Shabbat would enter, he would then squeeze the grape, make kiddush, and then even the fruit of that tree would have permit, been permitted for him to eat from. He couldn't wait three hours. Impatience. Chava gave him to eat from the fruit, and they brought death into the world. Had he have waited just three hours, all of mankind would have been immortal. With that act of impatience, they brought death to all of mankind. But God as a benevolent father gave the world a second chance at immortality. At the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, God Almighty forgave the nation and all of their previous sins. This pardon extended all the way back to Adam, first man in the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge. With that pardon, the nation became immortal once again. That condition lasted for only 40 days. Once the nation made the golden calf, well, their pardon was rescinded and they once again became mortal. Why did they make the calf? Impatience. Moshe was late and they couldn't wait. They panicked and they made the golden calf. We also read with the story of Korah, an illustrious individual. He was a Levite and one of only four men who carried, merited to carry the ark in the desert. He felt that due to his great wealth, status, and the fact that he had seen in a vision, in a prophecy, that Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, would be his descendant, as King David, as Dovan Malak stated in Psalms 99.6, that Shmuel was as great as Moshe and Aaron combined. All things considered, Korach felt that he deserved to be given much more honor than he had previously received. Rabbi Simcha Bunin stated that just like Korach could not wait patiently to be crowned leader, so too the earth could not wait patiently for his natural time to be laid to rest. So he went into the pit alive, Mida Keneged Mida, tit for tat. The laws of the Torah were meant to teach us to learn patience. We are by our heritage, an agricultural nation. Many of the laws of the Torah are connected with the land. You know, when a farmer plants his field, he waits impatiently for his crops to appear. Once they begin to sprout, he waits anxiously until they are ripe enough for him to harvest so that he can partake of his bounty. The Talmud the Gemara in Bab Messiah states that a person would prefer one bushel of their own wheat to nine bushels of someone else's. 
The Torah requires that before the farmer can enjoy the fruits of his labor, he must first separate a gift to God, what we refer to as bikurim, first fruits. That is just the beginning of his tithing. The first of the tithing that he is required to separate is called truma, 2%, the gift of the kohen. Next, he is required to separate maser rishon, 10%, the first tithing, which is given to the Levite. And finally, the last of the tithing is called Maser Sheni, the second tithing. Another 10%, which is brought up to Jerusalem to be eaten there on the first, second, fourth, and fifth years of the seven-year Shemitah cycle. One cannot partake of any of this produce unless they first redeem it with money and add a surcharge of one-fifth. Otherwise, the produce must be brought to Jerusalem and can only be eaten within the walls of the city. On the third and fifth of the seven-year Shemitah cycle, instead of second tithe, the second tithing, the farmer separates what we call Maser An-Oni, 10% as tithing for the poor. Then after a true display of patience, he can now enjoy the rest of his harvest in any fashion that he so chooses. However, on the seventh year, which is referred to as the Shemitah year, all the fields within the land of Israel must be left fallow. One is not permitted to work their field in any fashion. Perennial plants, such as orchards or vineyards, are deemed onerless for the whole year. Anyone, anyone has permission to enter your field and partake of whatever produce they wish. The owner cannot lock his gate, nor can he protest. He cannot perform any work that would improve his field. He must exhibit patience and restraint. You know, the Torah is replete with laws that require patience in performing God's commandments, whether at the correct time and in the correct manner. Not only in the field, but even in our homes and in our daily lives, such as the laws of family purity, dietary requirements such as eating milk after meat, fast days, times for prayer. Uh, the list goes on. Some of us are naturally punctual and others are perpetually late. It seems that is the situation in many marriages. You know, it becomes a real area of contention between the spouses right from the beginning of their marriage. My wife and I are no exception. I always, I am always on time and she is almost always late. I lie to her often. This condition existed from our first date together. You know, I told her I would pick her up at 7.30. And so, at 7.30 sharp, I rang the doorbell to her house. Her mother answered the door. She let me in. And then my wife began to get dressed. <laughs> her parents drilled me for a half hour. And then at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, she came down the stairs. Beautiful, of course. Well, the phone rang. And she answered it and began a conversation with her friend on the line. I walked over to her, whispered in her ear, and I said that I was going to count to ten, and then I was going to leave. I counted to ten. She was still on the phone. So then I turned and walked to the front door. When I reached the door, she was standing right by my side. Well, that worked until we had our first child. Well, that was 49 years ago. I still refer to her as the late Mrs. Goodman. I heard a lecture many years ago from a wise and knowledgeable rabbi, Rabbi Avigdor Miller. He advised in one of his many lectures that when a husband is waiting for his wife, you know, rather than argue about her tardiness and start the evening off on a negative note, he said, view the situation as an opportunity. Carry a safer, a Hebrew book with you at all times. And while you are waiting for your wife to get ready, well, study the book. Based on this advice, you should know that my wife takes complete credit for all the knowledge that I have accumulated through my 52 years of being married. In life, you have two choices. You can choose to argue and carry on disputes, or you can choose to find compromises that allow relationships to grow and develop. The true lesson of marriage is compromise. Men and women are different. They think different. They act different. They love different. Now, different doesn't necessarily mean better or worse. It's just another way to perceive a situation. Another thought is how to solve a problem. You know, in life, I think that it is important to at least acknowledge the fact that there may exist another solution 
to a difficult situation other than yours. Many times, the best answer is a blend, a compromise of the two approaches. Our patience even extends to God Almighty himself. Somehow when we pray and we make a, a request, we expect an immediate affirmation from God. If we don't receive a positive response immediately, we have questions. We never expect him to answer in the negative. After all, he is our father and we are his spoiled children. There are times when the answer is yes, but not yet. We accept that response as a no. Rather than allowing God time to reveal his miracles, well, we complain. Like spoiled children, we expect our request to be granted now. And when it is not, then we reject him in some way or another. You know, we are like Adam before he ate from the tree of knowledge. See, when Adam was first created, everything that he did was instantaneous. He didn't have to wait for the proper season to plant and then harvest. He asked God for rain and immediately vegetation grew. They didn't have to wait nine months to have a child. He had relations with his wife, Chava, and then they immediately had a child. We notice that a child, when it is first born, is a true reflection of God Almighty. It is said of God, who Amar Vayehi, he says, and it is. Well, the newborn baby believes exactly the same thing. It believes that everything that it desires should be theirs immediately, just as it was with Adam at the beginning of creation. In reality, God did not punish Adam and Chava for their transgression of eating from the tree of knowledge. Instead, he instructed them on the necessity of learning the art of patience in one's life. Through the difficulties involved in making a living and also the challenges related to childbirth and rearing children. We see a similar scenario repeated when looking at the forgiveness of the golden calf. As a sign that God had forgiven the nation for their sin, he instructed Moshe to have the people build for him a dira betachtonu, a dwelling place for his presence to reside in this physical world. The nation fulfilled God's request with a true sense of alacrity. They finished its construction in just under three months. They then anxiously waited for the command from God Almighty to erect the tabernacle. But God said no, that they would have to wait. Now, in their excitement, they were forced to wait another three months until God finally decided that they had learned their lesson. Only then were they permitted to erect and dedicate his house. He, as a loving father, taught them to exchange their impatience for patience. Patience leads one to a deeper appreciation of any experience that one cherishes or enjoys. You don't guzzle down a thousand dollar bottle of Chateau Lafitte wine, the same as you would drink a glass of orange juice. You would relish the experience and let the moment linger. One of our responsibilities as parents is to teach our child patience. Without the ability to wait for things to develop, one can rarely achieve success. You know, it takes three minutes to boil an egg. Anything less and it will still be raw. It takes nine months to allow a baby to develop fully in its mother's womb. Even though you might want that child's birth to occur after only two or three months, if that. Growth is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Impatience. There was a study done, done at Stanford University by a psychologist. The name was Professor Michael Wischel. It was done in the 1960s. It was referred to as the marshmallow test. The test was administered to four-year-old children from varied backgrounds. The child was seated in a room with an adult on the table in front of each child was a single marshmallow. The child was told by the interviewer that he needed to leave the room for a short time and, and that he would return shortly. In the meantime, if the child wanted, they had permission to eat the marshmallow now. However, if they waited until the interviewer returned as a reward, they would then be given another marshmallow, and then they could eat both of them when they wanted. Fourteen years later, these same, when these same children took their SAT exams, those children that had waited for the second marshmallow scored some 200 points higher on their SAT exams than did those who didn't have the patience to wait 
for the interviewer to return in patients. On the other hand, his patient is not always a negative. Impatient people are many times go-getters. They don't have the time or nor the patience for small talk. They cut right to the chase. They get things done now. Being both a parent and a teacher helps a person to develop more patience. If you are impatient with your children and or your students, they will feel uncomfortable asking you any question and it will hamper your ability to guide them on their path in life. You know, I believe that we were all created by God to be mortal human beings. Being immortal would have changed our whole existence. It would be a totally different world. I believe we would be arrogant and self-righteous. Time would lose all of its value. Being mortal makes us more vulnerable and makes us more human. I think that God intended for us to be mortal all along. He has given us his Torah replete with stories an entertaining way for us to learn through the lives of our predecessors. Now, some of those stories were meant to teach us patience. As we read, impatience can lead us down a road of sadness and regret. Yet we still need to maintain the strength of character to react quickly and decisively when the need arises. In those situations, patience can be a deficit. You know, I am by nature an impatient person. I always thank God Almighty that I didn't have to drive through rush hour traffic back and forth to work. I probably would have been forced into therapy. I, can't, I still can't figure out why. There are people who have no place to go, yet they are out in their car leisurely driving down the street 10 miles under the legal speed limit. However, much like the scenario with my wife, when I drive in my car, I make it a point to listen to a Torah lecture. If I'm not listening to a lecture then, I'm taking care of, bus of a business matter on my phone. So I no longer view any delay as a waste of time. As the saying goes, if all you have is lemons, then you should make lemonade. Bottom line, being impatient can be a problem. Being overly patient can also be a problem. So I think that the advice of the Rambam, Maimonides, is the correct approach. Take the middle road in life. Somehow things then just seem to work out for the best. It's not necessarily the traits that we were given that are good or bad. I think it is much more about how we apply them to our daily lives that decide the answer to that question. You know, we are told by the sages that God Almighty's greatest trait is erich apayim, long-suffering, patience. He allows us the time to try to work out our challenges the obstacles that we all must encounter as we journey through our lives. Many times, if we were just a little more patient, well, we would actually have reached our goal. We all need to be marathon runners. It's not always about how fast you run. The question many times is, can you finish the race? I believe, I believe that there is a reason as to why we live in a time in history where we are living longer lives, I think God is giving us another opportunity to get it together. Think of where you were in your life five years ago, 10, 20, even 30 years ago. I would hope that we can all say that we have grown, well, maybe not as much as we should or could have. Life, much like drops of water that create a hole in a stone, has a way of humbling the most arrogant of us. In the end, it has a way of crushing all of our egos. The Holy Baal Shem Tov stated on the words of the second paragraph of the Shema, and you will perish quickly from upon this good earth which God has given you. He interpreted these words to mean that it becomes our job, our responsibility to destroy our mehera, our impatience quickly so that we can truly enjoy Hatova, all the goodness that God Almighty has set up upside for us, Al Haaretz Hatova, upon this good earth. Let us not waste this opportunity. Let us learn to be patient with all those around us, patient to our family, patient to our friends, even patient with ourselves. But most of all, let us be patient with God Almighty, our Father in heaven. 
who we know is waiting impatiently for the exact moment when he can lead us all into a world of paradise. And with that, let us help to usher in the coming Mashiach Sukkana quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending. Again, God should bless you with health and with success and with happiness, all that is good. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.